Life is a constant lesson, where one can learn not only from experience, but also from mistakes. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome enthusiastic scuba diver and order to cash manager at Aggregate Industries, Phil Rice. And dedicated water skier, proud husband of a former world kickboxing champion and current director of credit and collections in Europe for Office Depot, John Wheeler. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, just a little picture of one of our dinky dumpers from the quarry. It carries about 100 tons in there. Um, well, you know me now, you've already seen me scuba diving. I'm the manager of Oster Cash Aggregate Industries. Uh, I work in their shared service centre in Colville in Leicester. We have 4,000 employees in the UK and a few scattered across Europe. And we have a £1.4 billion pound turnover. Now, yeah, there we are, scuba diving. I sent that to our chief executive. So I was very, very unhappy with the officers that we had for the staff. We had a, a leaking <coughs> roof. Uh, he was French, he didn't quite understand it, so he asked me how were the staff, and I said, well, I've only got fish in the office at the moment. But anyway, uh, Aggregate Industries, we're part of Lafarge Halsey. It's a very, very large global business. It operates in 90 countries. There's 115,000 employees. There's a Swiss franc turnover of 32.6 billion. Lots and lots of uh, capacity, 386 million tonnes of installed capacity, and that's rock in the ground that we process. And uh, the Forge Hull is one of the largest, or the largest, building materials supplier in the world by a country mile. Aggregate Industries, we, we're obviously a subsidiary of that. We're a leading player in the construction industry. We make grey mixed concrete, we make asphalt, we crush rock, we do precast concrete. So when you're in this building here, it's made of precast concrete. We haven't actually made this one, which is probably a fortunate thing. Uh, we also manufacture <laughs> cement and we also surface roads. So what did we supply in the UK? So in terms of aggregates, these are crushed rock, sand and gravel. We supplied 32.1 million tonnes. And to give you some perspective of that, um, a lorry that would deliver them carries 20 tonnes. So it's an awful lot of lorry movements. It's an awful lot of aggregates. And also a lot of asphalt, a lot of ready mix concrete, a lot of concrete products. This is where we are in the UK. Uh, some say that we put the rock and roll into the UK roads. I think we actually put the rock and roll into a lot of European roads. We supply out of quarries in Norway and Scotland into mostly the Baltic and um, Northern European countries. Uh, that's one of our ships. It doesn't look very big. But it carries 100,000 tonnes of aggregates and they travel into most of the Baltic seaports and they self-discharge. That's the boat again, that's the quarry. I'll put that little red dot on there if you can see that. The distance is four miles from that hole there down to the ship. And that gives you the size of the operation. And that little hole goes back <coughs> another kilometer. So there's a kilometer of belt in, in the mountain. So it's actually two kilometers because the belt has to come back. So that gives you some of the size and complexities of our organization. That's how you recognize us. We're all white with little blue triangles. We've got some trains as well as boats. So it's every boy's dream with the big machines. <laughs> so a quick question to give me a break and to see um, if you could get me the right answer. So. In terms of aggregates, how many million tonnes did we sell in 2014? Was it A, or was it B, or was it C, or was it D? And if we get it all wrong, do you tell us all again? Well, it's like, uh, who wants to be a millionaire? So we'll have a look. I think there's a bit of slow voting going on. This is a bit where you wonder whether it works. Wow. Well, 
well, most of you appear to have got that right. It was D, 32.5 <coughs> million tonnes. So well done there, everybody. We've got that. And we just wait for my slides to magically reappear. Has it appeared? It's appeared there. Right, well, in O2C, which we hear about, um, we've got 30,000 accounts. They range in credit limit terms from one thousand pounds up to 25 million pounds we deal with the white van man i don't know whether you get white van man in europe the small builder he has a van a transit van you probably have peugeot's do you or um what's your other favorite van out here skoda skoda kia, skoda, kia yeah that sort of thing we call them white van man you must call them skoda man out here or something like that but those are the types of people we deal with small to very very big multinationals do a lot of invoices every day do 10,000 invoices every day and we do those in a variety of currencies from euros to dollars and some of the other stranger currencies in europe and credit services we've got a team of 30 and we deal with all aspects of that um, in terms of master data we deal with the risk collection cash allocation and we've also got an academy which we'll talk about a little later we're also CICMQ accredited and we got that accreditation in 2010 we're also a center of excellence we've been a center of excellence with the CICM since 2014 so I thought we'd have a look at a few samples. Now, why are we doing this little bit about the company is they've paid for me to come out here and I just feel obliged to just tell a little bit about aggregate industries and so forth. But um, I've got his name written on here. Alberto will focus in on a couple of samples here that we've got with his camera. There we go. So these are quite heavy things. Right, so <laughs> do not try this at home. This has not been done in Eastern Europe before, but here we go. Please hold on to your water bottles. Well, <laughs> you want it back again? It's rubber, to be honest. With you. <laughs> you didn't seem as shocked as you should have been. <laughs> Have it back, it's the only one I've got. <laughs> whoa, whoa, there we go. Take that up later. Thank you very much. Right, so the scene five years ago where we were at Aggregate Industries, it was a bit unsustainable. Lots of processes, lots of procedures, it didn't work very well. We got bad staff morale, inadequate resources. You've already seen the state of my office. We also had a fire in the office. And we also had a rat as well, which wasn't very easy to deal with. So not good to encourage staff. So we need to get the office physical structure right first and uh, then deal with underperform underperforming O2C function. I put that in for no real reason other than it's a really nice calming picture. It makes me feel a little bit easier up here, but it also gives me a little bit of inspiration because that boat there it's got a couple of those dumpers that carry 100 tons on. The quarry you saw earlier, that was the boat going out to that quarry. There isn't a road there at all. Everything goes by sea, comes back by sea. It was an impossibility, but somebody actually did it. They created something out of the ground. No roads, no nothing. So a bit of inspiration for me. If they could do that quarry, then I think I could get O2C working a bit better. Right, first we created a roadmap. We also did a SWOT analysis. I don't know whether you're familiar with those. Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats. Nothing, nothing new about those. Uh, but these are some of the things that worked well for us, which I want to share with you. Just simple things, really. They're all common sense things that we can all do very, very easily. We changed the offering to the business. We changed our hours that we actually worked. We worked from 7.30 till 5.30. We used to work from 9 till sort of 4.30. We weren't there to answer customer queries, the business queries, etc. We also extended our daily banking hours so that we could bank checks. We had a lot of them, still do in the UK, but we can actually go down to our local bank at seven o'clock at night. We also put a team in to do cash allocation on a Saturday, especially when the weekend fell on a Saturday. We wanted to enhance our result. When mail comes in, we deal with it on a Saturday. 
councillors a month end. We also agreed SLAs for the business, and those are service level agreements. Very important because you give your customer, and you've got two of them, you've got the outside world, and you've got the inside business, the, your internal customer, and they've got an expectation from you, and they're part of that process, so you say you're going to do something, but they need to do something back. So you have a written agreement with them on how you're going to conduct things. New account process. We looked at that. We redesigned the account form, made it really simple to open an account. It used to take a couple of weeks to open an account, which is just unacceptable. We can do it in two hours now. Usually it's a normal business day, and that's what we put in an SLA. We've introduced prospect customers as well. So these are customers that don't have an account, but we've scored them ready. They're sat on our computer system, ready to be used. We offer them to the sales guys. Here's a customer, you might want to deal with him. He's already been pre-checked out. Just get him to fill a form in and open it up. So we've reversed it a little bit round with the sales team. We've gone to them and said, this is what we're going to do for you. The other thing is, never say no to an account. However bad he is, open that account up. We call them flex accounts. We just invented a nice name. I actually pinched it off the nationwide building society. Because <laughs> my bank account's called the flex account. But they foolishly did not copyright it. So I could use it. And the flex account, it generates around three million pounds worth of income every year. It's just a simple, we've given you an account, you have to deposit a sum of funds in with a credit card, and you can draw off materials anywhere in Europe on that. You get all the same preferences, delivery schedules, and everything else, as if you're a bona fide customer. And if the customer, the flex account customer, pays well, performs well, we turn them into a, an account. So, there you go. The other one was just a little bit of a play on the Apple theme and things like that. It's called the ideal account. These are marginal accounts, maybe not too good for credit. Didn't want to turn them down. We didn't want to offer them a flex account. So we offered them a 5k credit limit. They had to have invoices electronically. They had to pay electronically. So the actual cost of maintenance was very, very low with that account. So the risk was minimal and the maintenance cost was low as well. The other thing we do is look at dormant accounts, all those people who fell off the ledger for some reason. And they might not have been closed or gone dormant because of a payment issue, but for some reason, they just didn't feel loved any longer. So we created a reactivation team. They spoke to the customer, got them hooked up with our salespeople, and that generates around about five million pounds worth of revenue every year. So it became a proactive credit function. The other thing we looked at was invoicing and payments. Cash allocation was a nightmare. Lots of paper at the end of the month end. We had 20 million pounds worth of cash at every month end that we were unable to allocate to the correct agent. Because time wise we were out of time, and B, we weren't quite sure somewhere that piece of paper was lost in an office of 50 people. So we introduced uh, a module called Allocate. I think you heard Tim mention it earlier. Very, very good product. Not only did it uh, speed up our allocation and gave clarity, we also reduced our FTE count by six people. And we reduced that on allocated cash. We run around about a million pounds worth of unallocated cash in there because they are on account payments, genuine payments. The other thing we did as well was a customer portal. We wanted a one-stop shop. Instead of everybody ringing up and saying, can you send me a copy <coughs> invoice? Well, go and get it yourself. We've got them all on a portal. They're all held digitally. You log on and take it. If you want a proof of delivery, get it yourself. It's all on there. Anybody who wants one now, we'll do an occasional one. But if they want more than that, we'll say it's going to cost you five pounds if you want a ticket. Or you can just log on yourself and do it yourself. And we accept payments by cars, which is something we didn't do before. And you can actually pay your account online with a card. So when you're on your Caribbean holiday, and I forgot to pay Aggregate Industries, <coughs> give him a quick call while he's on the beach, and then he just logs onto his smartphone and he makes a card payment. So there's no escaping anymore. 
Everything is available 24-7. The other thing we looked at is electronic invoicing. 60% um, of the invoices are now delivered by EDI or email. That brought big cost savings for us. It was obviously speedier, it's more efficient, things don't get lost, and there's less reliance on mail delivery. And no doubt it's the same over here as it is in the UK. Mail can sometimes be very, very poor. We also looked at payments, and we invoice and receive payments in multi-currencies in addition to checks and backs. We take all major cards, we do direct debits, uh, we use PayPal, and we're looking at PayM, and we're looking at various other card solutions. Now, over a five-year period, 10% of our payments were electronic. The rest were checks, basically. So there's three, four days check clearance time. So we've had a big campaign of turning people into electronic payment mechanisms. We're doing 75% of it now electronically. So they're cleared funds into the bank in time. So big, big effect for your cash flow, big effect on your DSO. The other thing we did as well was a power dialer. We are introduced to one. It's a, a, a very, very good mate called Touchstar by Davica. They had never done a business-to-business -business operation. They'd used call centers before, so it's quite a new phenomenon for them. But it increased our outbound calls by 50% year on year. And with a team of about 13 collectors, we do around about 13,000 outbound calls every month. And in addition to that, we take in another 13 inbound calls. So it's very, very busy traffic volume. So the dialer helps us to, to manage that. So it's easier to target overdue customers. It's like a big diary system. If you couldn't get hold of the customer, it fell back into the pool, came back up to the credit control at a later stage. If you said, I've put a check in the post or I've sent you a payment, you press a simple mouse click and say, payment's on its way. It diarises for three days. If the payment's not in, it's back up for a collector to remind that customer that he hasn't actually done what he said he was going to do. So it's very, very quick and easy. We also can monitor the calls and we can coach people because we can listen live and we can also listen to the recorded voice afterwards and go through with the credit control and say, was that really the best way to deal with it all? So it improves the whole collection process. So we originally had over 50 people in the office, but with the dialing, <laughs> the allocation system and streamlining of life processes, and we also onboarded, and onboarding means we took on other subsidiaries into the shared service centre. We actually managed to reduce our FTE by 30. And what we did with those 30 people is we gave them, and still do, a very comprehensive training programme. And it's very easy for us all to know how Word works or Excel works, but I'm sure there's one or two of you here, including me, who can't remember how to do a pivot table or simple things in Excel because you don't do them every day. And what had happened in the past is we assume everybody knows everything now because we're in this digital <coughs> modern age and you sit somebody in front of a screen. So we go back to the basics and retrain them on the bits they missed out. So they become competent in Word, they become competent in Excel. And that's often overlooked. And we've got Google Mail, and everybody's probably got something very similar on a smartphone here. But there's lots of bits and pieces on Google that you don't understand probably, that we train people on. And we use Google Mail in aggregate industries, and there's Google Drive, there's Google everything on there. So there was always that assumption that people knew everything. So that's one of the failings, I think, um, of, of the business before I started there. We train people on legal processes and what actually happens when it goes to court, what does it mean, what's the expectation and so forth. We also do a lot of telephone uh, collection techniques and we use the Chartered Institute of Credit Management. I can say that now, it's a bit difficult sometimes to, to say CICM. Um, we use them in-house, we send staff to seminars, training programs, we send managers and supervisors out on courses and we sponsor the Chartered Institute of Credit Management study. We've currently got three people who've reached graduate status. We've got three associate status. We've got 10 people actually going to college in the evening after work to study for their exams. 
and we've got 14 affiliate members. Those are people who are probably not really interested in career advancement, but they do an exceptionally good job. They could be in cash allocation, but I want them to be part of the process. They've been encouraged to join, we pay for the fees. One of the things that we needed to do was change the attitude of everybody. And I used a, a simple process, it's called FISH. What you need to do is go and look at it on the internet, WWW FISH something. It's about a fish stall in Seattle and about their way that they dealt with customers because they assumed everybody knew what they were talking about. But FISH alters the culture of your office or alters the culture of most organisations because we want customers to come back. We want people to feel that they want to work at aggregate industries and it improves the whole teamwork aspect. So I recommend you have a look at that. It's FISH, that's the logo, because there'll be lots of other fishes on there, but that's the one you want to have a look at. But FISH, it changed attitudes in the office. People started to work as a team. We held social events. We went to charity events. We held celebrity lunches if somebody had done really well in the office. Well, we'll take them out for lunch. And it made a better place for people to work. And I always say, and it is difficult, leave your attitude out on the car park. You can pick it up on your way home, but don't bring it into the office. Yes, we all have some problems and somebody may feel sad or down, but you don't want them to destroy the office. I call them the office terrorist. You can have one person, and they're very powerful, because they control the other 30, the mood hoover. They come into the room, it's a bit like, I feel it all been sucked out, can't you? All the enthusiasm disappears and everybody goes downhill. It's a bit like when you're in a plane, isn't it? When it's coming to land, they switch the engines off, don't they? Pull it back a bit and it's on that glide path downhill. So you need to deal with the mood hoover or the office terrorist. So the other thing to do is engage the team. And there are a few taglines and let's go for it. Our CFO wanted a four million pound reduction in the end column. If you're a credit control person, you'll know what the end column is. It's the age debt. So it's not acceptable, I wanted four million pounds. So nice little tagline, got everybody involved in it. So the four is the four million. This year, he said, oh, that was really good. I want a 25% reduction now on your age debt. No bother, I think of the tagline. Drive for 25. It gets everybody involved in it all, so we all know where we are. We produce the stats every month on the drive to 25. Have regular staff meetings. We have little huddles as well around boards, and we can deal with people's issues if they're not feeling too well or they've got a bereavement in the family. And we understand it then, rather than it dominating the office. We have totem boards in the office. Everybody's results for their section and for the company, so they know where they are, and that's important. I have something else, the Exceptional Achievers Program. We have a staff bonus scheme, we pay people reasonably well. This is something that we do in our office, and it's not contractual, but it's an Exceptional Achievers Program. You have to do something exceptional to gain a reward, and I know reward should be smart, is it? This should be whatever it is achievable and all those sort of things. I just go a little bit more than the HR people would like. This is exceptional performance and people can be exceptional if you motivate them. So we have a couple of draws in the office and they'll take place on the 22nd of December. The whole team has to hit a certain amount of KPIs just for 10 months out of 12 and one of them has to be December month. So we're a bit flexible if you're on holiday or you're covering for somebody who's not there. It's 10 out of 12 months to achieve a very high standard. Your name goes in a bag and the lucky winner gets an iPad to walk away with. Every month, the top performer in three sections, they go out to lunch. Top collector gets a day off. The second best collector gets half a day off. So we, we think that's quite good. 
it does motivate people. Lots of people want to have 12 days extra holiday, so there's a lot of competition in the office, but only one person can get it. We also take people out to events, um, to the Chartered Institute of Credit Management Fellows lunch, the credit awards that they have every year, lots of networking events. We also do staff exchanges, and we take members of staff to a totally different business. They spend a day there with the credit team, and we take their team back into our place. They can share best practice, see some of the problems, how do we deal with things, and it's like-minded people. We set up a credit academy, and we've taken on two school leavers. We've got them in an advanced apprenticeship scheme. This is a government scheme. In aggregate industries, we've got probably 30 or 40 apprentices, but they deal with things like those ships, those great big trucks, they drill rock and blast it out, all those sort of big heavy things, mechanical engineering. First time ever, we've got two office-based apprentices. So they're at our office. They're on an advanced apprenticeship program with a local college. They're studying for their CICM exams in the evening after the college. And it's going to produce us with cost-effective trained people who've been through all of our processes, but importantly as well for a very, very big company. Um, it ticks that little box for corporate social responsibility. <coughs> We're a major employer in Colville, and the shared service centre does about 350, 400 people work there. We're a very, very big employer. We've got one humongous quarry in Colville next to our shared service centre. It's very, very big. The hole in the grounds, quarter of a mile deep and half a mile across. Lots of lorries, big construction work. So this is a little bit back for the local community. Two people who live in Colville and go through a train scheme. Credibility, and I think that's an important thing if you're running an OTC function or a credit function. And we went on the CICMQ uh, accreditation process. I don't know what you can do out here in Eastern Europe, but I believe you may be able to link into this process because I think they do it in Australia now. But it was important for us because it gave us confidence as a team and it gave us recognition in the industry, it gave us recognition in the company, and it also differentiated us from our competitors, which we felt was really, really important. And it also ensured a constant high standard of everything we did. It also led to us achieving a centre of excellence in the UK through the Chartered Institute of Credit Management, and I believe we're the only one of two companies, and Brian's company is one of the others, and aggregate industries is the second one. But what I put on there is join your local association. I put A C C E E, if that's how you say it. Embrace them, join them, you'll learn a lot. It's important to do that. The other bit as well, um, I heard somebody say sales prevention. Now I, I went to our company conference and somebody suddenly shouted up from the audience, here he is, the sales prevention officer. And I'm not usually too quick thinking when I get onto a platform in front of lots of people, but I actually felt a little bit angry with the person. And I said, I think you can do a really good job at that without any help from me. <laughs> <laughs> um, the reason for this slide is we actually work very, very closely with our sales team. We actually train them and there's a module where they all have to sit. The Institute of Sales and Marketing exam is a qualification at several levels in the UK. All of our sales team have to pass that. One of the modules is a crate module, and we train people on those. And we mentor them as they go through that process because we're part of the finance team as well. And we hold regular road shows with the sales team and um, we call them cash box talks. It'll mean nothing to you, but we have something called toolbox talks because we're a big heavy industry. We call toolbox talks where we talk to the workers about things that could be done better, safety, etc. And I've just pinched it and turned it to the cash box talk because it's more appropriate because it's cash we're talking about. 
Right, so I can just have a little drink of water. I'm curious. So, <coughs> what do you think would be the driver in O2C? So is it A, staff morale? Is it B, automated processes? Is it C, credibility? Or is it D, staff training? <laughs> Ah, staff morale. Interesting. <laughs> I would have said, sort of that, I would have actually said credibility because uh, we have to have credibility with our business at the end of the day. Uh, if things go wrong, you need them to be with you, those salespeople, and uh, help shoulder things when things aren't running too well. But, interesting. I think we're ready. I'm glad I'm not doing this bit. It would go wrong if I was working that thing in the back. Right, the other thing that you should do, and we do really, really regularly, is find out what people really think and do a staff survey and do them regularly. You'll always get that slight office terrorist will put a bit of poison thing in it, but if you look at the broad spectrum, you'll get a good idea of where you are with things in any survey. Do them with the customers, being your external customer. Do them with your internal customers. Find out what works and doesn't work. Find out what they really think. It'll give you some first-hand information and you'll be able to very, very quickly change something and make it work. And then eventually, you'll see the problem or the gripe disappear off your survey. But don't be afraid of criticism. Okay, somebody can be quite spiteful with criticism, but a lot of people will give you some really constructive criticism that you probably weren't aware of as a team, and you're able to redress that and make it better for them, better for you. <coughs> you can do it very, very easily on SurveyMonkey, or you can do them on Google Consumer Survey. I think all of them are free. They're really, really worth doing. Get nice little graphs and pie charts and things like that and see what's really happening with it all. So, uh, over five years, with some of the things that we in improved and changed <coughs> in aggregate industries, we saw our KPIs improve. And when I said world class, I'm not measuring our very poor results against anybody else in the world. I'm measuring them against Lafarge Holcim and they're in 90 countries in the world, and they have a league table. I don't like being at the bottom, number 90, which we were five, <coughs> six years ago. We're now in the top one or two when it comes to O2C. Um, next challenge for us is to take in that dialer information, there's a lot of information on that, allocate and our own platform and credit status information. So we're looking at behavioral scoring we're looking at targeted call programs and integration into Google and smartphones with self-serve. So in summary, you need to engage and invest with your staff. You need to do the same with technology and your local credit people. I can't say it. Is it A-C-C-E-E? -E? Mm -hmm. I can. And invest in the future. So you need to get informed. Get inspired, get impassioned, get active. Remember, I pinched this off Brian, getting better doesn't stop. I'll leave you with one last little phrase which I put on my email sometimes to our sales team. Do nothing, get nothing. So thank you very much, thank you very much for listening. I hope that's right, that was Google, so if it's wrong I do apologise. <laughs>
and they like that because they've given half a day's commitment. They also work very, very quickly because they want to get out, it's a weekend, so they've gained a day's holiday. Yeah. Ah, Andre, is it? That's <laughs> uh, okay, uh, From your presentation, uh, it is... Do I need to get another job? Yeah. <laughs> I wish you. <laughs> I wish you were promoted to the director's position oh, of the. Oh, of rock throwers. Yeah, you know Switzerland is not a very good country to live, no. but they, they might be pushing on you to, to come. Yeah. So, which I wish you to, yeah. to have a challenge. Uh, my question is a bit different. Oh um, dear. From your nice story, you uh, it shows that you were investing quite a lot uh, into the people. Yes in development, that's your time, that's in the resources of the company, yes. and people are growing, they are becoming credit managers. Yes. Uh, let me ask you a tough question, which I normally do. What happens and how you deal with when, after all of this investment, people continue to be very nice, they don't change their attitude, Right. but they are already fed up with the credit <coughs> Um I found when we change things, they actually distance themselves because the team got better, the team wanted to go to another level. Those people who didn't want to stay probably felt uncomfortable, they left. We reduced the number from 50 to 30, but nobody was made redundant. It was, you want to be part of this team, we're going to win, we're going to take on a challenge it's going to change. If you don't want to be part of that process, then you're free to leave because I'm not stopping you. Do you know my comment? Go on. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Any any further questions? Those are going to be around tonight and tomorrow as well. So if you need any remix concrete, asphalt, <laughs> let me know. Our boat does come up the Danube. <laughs> Not, it's too big to go. It's not enough water. No, it's not enough water. Thank you very much. <laughs> Afternoon, everybody. Um, I realise I'm standing between you and uh, the end of today and a chance to enjoy the leisure facilities in the hotel and uh, get your glad rags on for the award dinner tonight. So I'll try and move re reasonably quickly. Um, there's a lot I want to cover. Certain bits I'll focus on more than others. Um, partly because I understand some bits better than others, the complex bits I'll skip over. Um, but uh, similarly, I'll, I'm around later on, I'm around all day tomorrow. So things that I do rush through, by all means, uh, catch me later on and uh, I can uh, give a bit more detail around, around some of those aspects. It's interesting seeing that Phil's also uh, interested in water sports. Um, I enjoy uh, water skiing in the summer, surfing in the winter. Um, maybe we just like being in deep water, or maybe we just like wearing rubber. Um, I'm going to talk about our journey up with our finance shared service centre, specifically credit and collections uh, in Office Depot. Uh, we started about eight years ago. Uh, it's based in uh, inclusion of pocket in the Transylvania region of, uh, of Romania. Um, it's an eight year timeline, but I focus more on the last um, five years, specifically the last three years when we've made most progress. Uh, look at what we've learned, um, the importance of harmonizing activity around best practice, and that's something we didn't do at the start, but have made up ground in, in recent years. Uh, the need for a structured career path, supported by a very good training plan. Um, and the allocation of activity between um, the, the um, people in the shared service centre and people based in the countries. So we have a, a mixed model, it's not all in one place. The majority is in the shared service centre, but we have some small country teams uh, as well. And then I look about, uh, we've been successful in, in what we've been attempting to achieve. Um, a bit about the company. Um, I won't go for all of it, um, but you can see the numbers there. It's, it's a big organisation, it's a lot of office supplies. Um, we operate around the world, 
Um, we have a huge range of products, about 85,000 different uh, stop, stop keeping units um, in Europe alone. And that's grown all the time. As we take on some big strategic customers, we add in, in more products uh, that they want us to source and supply to them. And we deliver every day about 250,000 parcels. Um, and when you break it down, it's about 500 every minute, or about nine per second. Um, so while I'm talking here, we have delivered thousands and thousands of parcels uh, around Europe. So it, it's a big numbers business. Um, we have three main channels to the market. Contract channel is, is public sector and large corporates, uh, big organisations. Uh, we have a direct channel, known as Viking Direct, that you may have heard of. Uh, it sells to SMEs, consumers, uh, white van man that uh, Phil uh, referred to. So anybody that wants office supplies uh, will go through one, one of those two channels. Or in France and Sweden, we have uh, retail stores. So first question, just to check that everybody's uh, alert. Um, size of office depots, active customer base in Europe. So if you choose please one, two, three or four. question because it's difficult knowing the numbers that I put up around deliveries etc that could be one customer or loads of stuff and we do have that profile as well or it could be all the small customers um, but um, going on to the next slide it'll actually show you the, um, the true answer uh, it's about two million um, so it, it's a big customer base it's a big sales ledger um, it, uh, it keeps us awake at night sometimes, wondering what they're all up to, will they still be trading tomorrow. Um, it needs a lot of people to, to, uh, to tackle that number of uh, customers. Um, and as alluded to in early presentations around one question earlier was, does automation allow you to reduce the number of people? Um, and in our case, the answer is it, it can help, but in my view, it means we can talk to more people with the same number of people. There's, there's always more customers we'd like to speak to more often. But speaking to customers is, is really what we do. Whether it's about risk, collecting cash, or, or whatever it might be, resolving issues. So it's a big customer base. Um, a shared service centre in, uh, in Cluj. Um, I've brought some colleagues with me. I don't know if you'd like to stand up, please. <laughs> Hello. Uh, seven colleagues uh, from uh, from our shared service centre, the Mag magnificent seven. Um, they're the ones that have, that have done everything I'm going to talk about. So it's just my privilege to, to be able to present it. But they they've done the real work. They're they're the heroes. They're the people. If you want a good detailed answer in the bar later, they'll uh, they'll have all the information. Um, so. Uh, Deanna, our, our training manager, is involved in a, a panel session tomorrow. And I'll talk about training uh, shortly. Um, but uh, and, and they've been involved either directly or as part of the, of the, the workshops we've held for our, our harmonisation activity that I'll come on to shortly. So they're, they're the real heroes in, that, in this story. And it's been my privilege to work with them for, for eight years now as we've, we've developed and transitioned uh, activity. <coughs> Uh, straight from the, the offering in the shared service centre. So Cluj, um, it's a university town, about 100,000 students. Um, we opened uh, in October 2007. We actually started the transition in August that year. Um, so, and, and some people have been around since, uh, since August. Adrian was one of our first recruits um, in, in <laughs> August. Some people have, know uh, Adrian's done presentations uh, here before. So he's well known to some of you. Um, the initial rollout was complete by September 2008, but we've transitioned extra scope, uh, 2011, and then in, in the past couple of years. The AR team, um, we call it AR because we're an American owned company. We don't particularly like the term, the country single, but uh, it's, we're, we're stuck with it with our US parent. But basically, the, the credit collection team, 300 people now. Um, the top picture in the top part of, of the eight was uh, when we opened um, in 2007. We opened the UK um, contract business. 
And then the picture at the bottom is, uh, is now taken recently to celebrate the eight years of, uh, of operation in our shared service centre. So gives you an idea of the context, the change we've gone through in those eight years from a very small team at the start to a, a very large team now. We're approaching 550 people in, in the shared service centre. Um, as we've added, in addition to finance, we have other operations uh, for Europe uh, that uh, are there too. Last three years, I mentioned just now, we've, we've made most progress. Um, and we've been moving from um, country silos. And again, silos have been mentioned a few times that, that silos aren't good, whether it's departmental silos. In our case, it's more country silos. Um, we have about 21 businesses operating across, uh, across Europe, um, independent legal, legal entities, different systems, different people, different approaches. And all of that was just lifted and dropped into the shared service center um, initially, not much was done to actually harmonise activity. Um, the real success is because of the great people, including the, the magnificent seven that are, that are here today. Uh, but across the shared service centre, it's, it's the people that have made the difference. People who are very energetic, intelligent, enthusiastic, um, energetic, have, have delivered the success that, uh, that I'm going to talk about now. Um, I won't go through step by step, uh, but as I mentioned, we started August 2007 with, with the transition work. Um, we've had three main transitions, and, uh, and probably the, the bit uh, that I want to talk about most is, is the harmonisation activity moving from, from a country-based or country silo operation into a European approach. Uh, and then in the past um, year, or year and a half, we've also had another transition of activity as part of a European transformation program. Basically it's the rest of the organisation catching up with the idea that it doesn't make sense to operate with separate countries, it's better to have a, a European approach. So that's been going on across the organisation and we've transitioned more work in, in the past year or so. <coughs> So, um, in terms of harmonisation, I've got quite a few slides here. I won't go through each one in detail, as I say, because there's a lot of information in them. It's more to give you the, an insight into the fact we went through a, a logical um, process, step by step. We didn't just march in and start changing stuff, which was my idea, but better, better people said, no, that's not the right way to do it. Let's slow down and do it methodically. So, eventually I said, well, okay, yeah, you're probably right. Um, it's important, in my view, to start early. And uh, I've read a lot about some of the, the issues that can occur in a shared service centre. Uh, lift and drop is the normal BPO term for the, the early transition. You take things as they are in countries, you move it across, you drop it in, you document the process flows and, and desktop procedures um, as to how the work's carried out. But then in, in many cases, and certainly in our cases, that just carries on. Um, not much work is done to actually align around best practice. Um, so we decided everything's in scope. Um, but we needed a, a methodology for prioritization because there was so much of to change. We wanted to make sure we got it right. So normally there's lots of low hanging fruit. There's, there's lots of things you can do quickly. Um, there's other things that take a longer time. And, a lot of people have mentioned IT, um, and we can relate to all of the comments made um, during the day. When we looked at the, the list of things we wanted to do, if it involved IT, it was kind of, well, that's not going to happen this year then. We need to uh, be realistic. So IT resources is, is uh, an issue for us, as for most organisations, uh, discussions around ERP projects we, we can relate to as well. So the main objective, agree on best practice, and then align everybody around that. And that can be something different. It doesn't mean you, you pick which one's best and, and go with that. It could be we haven't found the best practice yet. Um, we need, need to identify it. <coughs> Try for consensus, but sometimes you just have to do it anyway. Uh, make a decision and, and go for it, rather than, than debate for too long. Um, and create European teams. As I mentioned, we're moving away from country silos, which have been in place for, for, uh, for some time, since we went live eight years ago. Um, but in many areas, it makes sense to have a, a European team um, separate. For example, um, cash application is less language dependent. 
Uh, it makes perfect sense to have a European cash application team. As previously, we had a separate one by, by country uh, and also by channel within country. Um, looking at quality, that's another area that, uh, that was crying out for a European approach rather than each country developing something. Um, and also reporting. And I'll come on to KPIs in a minute, one of our, our success areas. So one of the busy slides I mentioned. Anybody who knows me knows that I didn't create this. Um, <laughs> oh, I've got my PowerPoint skills. I shamelessly stole all the good slides you'll see I, I stole from Joanna. Um, so uh, um, don't ask me too many technical questions on any of this because uh, um, I may not know the answer. But um, this was mainly saying that we had a long list of, of issues we wanted to fix. Um, and it was a, a, long, a long process to get to that long list. Um, but we had to prioritise and be realistic and say, where do we start? With which ones will deliver the biggest benefit to get to a short list? Um, and the next slide shows a process for that. But this, this captures not the information. As I mentioned, I can go through this with any, anybody that's in this stage of a shared service centre um, over the next, uh, next day and a bit. This was the, the very simple process we used to, to get from the long list to the short list. Um, and it's a very simple model and it, it's been, been around for a long, long time. On the left hand uh, vertical axis is the, the benefit. So if it's high benefit, whether it's financial, reducing expense, um, or it could be a better, better service to customers. And then along the bottom, um, horizontal line is the, the ease of implementation. Um, IT complexity is obviously a, a, key, a key part here. So the sweet spot is the top right hand corner. So high benefit, easy to do. That's the low hanging fruit. That's the ones that, that, that we started with. Um, and then some of the ones in the middle, it's going over, perhaps that's phase two. And then the ones in the bottom is a longer term um, solution. It needs a business case and it needs IT support. Um, so. Those are the ones that are, that are still there, that, that we're working through, but we've made excellent success with the ones we identified for our shortlist that, that were the top priorities. Critical points here, and, and the next couple of slides after this actually, actually show it much better than, than, uh, than me going through <coughs> bullet point by bullet point on here. Um, but the top two is around setting the, the as is, how do we do it now? capture that. If you think of the 21 odd business, businesses, it's no mean feat to say, well, how do we do all this stuff now? Um, but a key point in, in the, the measure category is actually validating it. Um, and for example, Bob Dam's heavily involved on risk assessment um, and actually checking that what we think we do is actually done. So to hold workshops with the, the subject matter experts and say, right, well, the, the process map and, and, the, and the policies and procedures say this is what we do in terms of risk assessment, what do we actually do? Um, and there were some differences. And it's, and it's key to find out you know, a true as is what's actually going on um, country by country, business by business, rather than rush into assumptions that everybody's doing it as, as per policy. Um, I'll jump to the next two slides because they actually show um, in, in good detail what's behind this. Um, this is one example of, of looking at um, process maps. This is around the cash application area. This is, this is inputting the data from a, from a bank statement into our systems. Uh, top one um, statement input for, for UK was, uh, was very complicated, uh, an hour and 35 minutes. Um, in the Netherlands, it was about seven minutes. So it's, we had a clear winner. We knew which one was uh, straightforward. Um, so it, and putting it into this process map showed us instantly which, which is the way we need to go. So selecting best practice for this particular example was, was extremely easy. Um, the next step, and using this same example, if you look at the top left hand corner, uh, this is a statement input part of this, this longer process of allocating cash received by a bank transfer. So below each step of the process, to get to the ideal flow, what does it mean for each country? Comparing what do we do now? what do we want to do in the future state. So it's a very methodical approach, um, detailing, and, and this is just a, just a small part. Um, with, there's many more um, pages just to this, this one process flow. But it just highlights the, the extent of the task. This allows us to say what, what's realistic in terms of time frame. 
and allow us to get into the detailed planning to actually make the change happen and get to the uh, get to the future state. A couple of examples of, of uh, success. Um, looking at the way we collect cash, where we operate our dunning cycles, um, was very different. Uh, we wanted a common European approach, uh, but we accepted we need certain flexibilities. We will never get customers in Spain to pay on, on day 31. Uh, we can in, uh, in, in Germany and Austria, for example, we have a very low DSO um, and we, we go through the chase cycle very quickly. Um, in, in Spain, things take a little bit longer. Um, so, but it's the same principle, it's, it's exactly the same approach. We just build in different timings in terms of, of the, the cycle, but also have different cycles per risk profile. Rather than one size fits all, it's to base our collection cycles on perceived risk, either of bad debt or risk of delayed payment, based on all the data that, that we've got on our, on our sales ledger. Um, and using in information from credit information providers. Um, so combining that information gives us up-to-date risk assessment, our own payment data, we can profile our customers, put them in the right chase path. Um, the, the big benefit we've had here is actually sharing the results as, as we try different cycles before each country operated independently. Not much data was shared, even though we're in the same building. Um, but people don't walk over to colleagues and say, all right, we tried this last week, it's working really well, why don't you have a go? That was the old world. Now, and, and a lot of this activity has actually got people speaking to each other during this process, but also afterwards. So to, to, to keep this process going, and compare notes and make sure we, we're moving forward as a European team rather than separate country teams. KPI has been an interesting one when we had the workshop, um, I think it was around eight, April 2013. It's one of the more heated workshops. Um, people like to cling on to their certain measurement. Um, we had hundreds and hundreds, um, <coughs> everyone different, different way of measuring the same thing by, by channel, by country. Um, one of our big successes was age debt where we said age debt will be measured by due date, excluding all credits, to keep it very, very pure, transparent, simple, and that's now operated since July last year in, in every, every business. Um, it's been a good success. We've been able to drive down the, the age debt because we're looking at a common way. It creates a bit of rivalry between teams as to who's going to um, achieve the best reduction, which country is going to have the, uh, the highest debt, um, etc. For Spain, we used to have to put them on a separate chart because the old debt was so high and the, 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 uh, the charts didn't work. Um, but now they're on the same, they're delighted because they're on the same graph as uh, other countries. So, an indication of success there. So, transparency is important before we argue about why well, your measurement's rubbish, doesn't take account of this, um, etc. It was bad practice, countries would, would store up old credits um, to make the age debt look better. Um, when you strip out the credit, suddenly a debt profile looked quite good, suddenly looked terrific. Um, so it got to the truth to say, well, what is our actual performance, stripping out all of the, all of the noise and uh, etc. So these are a couple of examples of, of what we've been doing when we've been uh, harmonising activities. Um, this is probably the bit I'm, I'm more passionate about is, is, is career path and training. Um, as I mentioned, Deanna will, will be on the panel tomorrow to talk about our, our approach to, uh, to training um, and I'll ask some questions around that. Um, this is probably something we should have started day one. So with hindsight, if we turn the clock back, we would have said, right, this, this should have been our first priority, uh, to create a, a, a career path. Um, as a large credit organisation, it makes no sense, as we had at the time, just to have two levels. Um, the demographics work against us in many ways. Um, our average age in shared service centres is about 26. Um, around 90% of people have a degree. Um, and we have a lot of people in, in Generation Y. Has anybody heard of Generation X, Generation Y? <coughs> um, it's actually true. <laughs> and I know this because I've, I've got five daughters. And I've got three that are Generation X and two that are Generation Y. And Generation Y daughters would soon lose a limb than not have the smartphone in their hand. 
They're, they're obsessed. They buy waterproof ones so they can still text people in the shower. Um, so for them, not to have a smartphone would be the end of the world. Um, so whereas Generation X, take it or leave it. Um, they have a smartphone, but half the time they don't know where it is. Um, it's more interested in living a life and speaking to people than looking at the screen. So it does actually fit into to the, the general characteristics of, of uh, Generation X, Generation Y, and the dates. So it's usually around sometime in the early 90s when it switches from X to Y. Um, big challenge for us is Generation Y are, are very patient. They don't want to stay in a job for, for years and years. They want to, want to progress quite quickly and patient. Um, and it can be a good thing or a bad thing. In terms of credit collections, it's a challenge because length of employment brings many benefits in terms of building up knowledge and expertise. Um, so if people don't feel there's, there's progression soon enough, people will start to look outside. And, and people have lots of opportunities. So it, it, it's a challenge for us to keep attrition at a manageable level. Um, it will never be as low as, as, say, the UK, where in many cases it's too low. People don't leave fast enough sometimes. Um, in, uh, in a shared service centre environment, it's, it's been a challenge keeping them as, as long as we can. And that's our responsibility, to, to create a nice environment to work in that's challenging, but also rewarding in terms of a career path. And um, I know how many people are familiar with um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, uh, developed in 1943. It stood the test of time for about 70 years. And it's actually been a, been a very sound model, um, starting with, with the physiological needs, need, need to sleep and have sustenance at, at the very bottom, up to self-esteem, self-actualization. And this is very much tied in with, with a career path. We want to reward people for doing well and, and have a, a career for them for the long term. Um, but actually, the chart's now out of date, and it's Generation Y that caused, uh, caused the change, because the bottom of the pyramid has now got a, another section that's far more important than, than sleep or food for Generation Y. And that's Wi-Fi access and battery life. And why is why is length of employ, employment important? Why do we want to keep people for, for a good period of time? Um, it's behavioural skills, uh, in my view, very important for credit collections. Uh, technical skills are, are, are key as well. But it's the behavioural side. Our, our job involves speaking to customers, speaking to salespeople, customer services. Um, and as John mentioned earlier, being a customer service function, actually providing added value so we get disputes resolved in a way that customers want to come and buy from us again. And our industry is very competitive. We don't have a monopoly on any, any products, um, etc. Everybody delivers next day, similar prices. So creating a good customer experience is, is critical for customer retention. Um, there's a lot of grey area around risk. We can't afford to turn away customers, um, similar to Phil. We don't want to say no and say, well, it, look, it looks a bit, bit risky, so we'll just say no this time um, and, and turn, the, turn the order away. We don't like to do that. Um, so risk decision in is, is, is a critical part. Um, we want to build relationships rather than conquests with our customers. And that, that relies on experienced people. So tenure is important, and, and but that's our responsibility, as I say, to, to create the right environment and opportunities. Um, this is just some of the, the roles that we have now. Um, this would have been a very different chart eight years ago, with just, just two blobs on it. So huge progress has, has been made, a lot of it in, in the last three years, to actually create opportunities for, for people as, as they progress to specialise in certain areas get recognition as, as they move through the uh, through the career path. In terms of, of management roles, again those have been expanded. Um, management can be pure people management. Um, managers are also involved in projects and, and the harmonisation activity has drawn on the expertise of, of, uh, of the managers. The operation managers um, have been very much involved in, in the harmonisation work uh, because they've got the detailed knowledge and uh, <clears throat> they're the ideal people to, to be involved in, in taking us forward to where we are now. When we, when we look at promotions, it's very important, and, and, and this is a view I've held for a long time, that if you get a promotion that just happened because you've been there for so many years, it doesn't feel that great. If you've had to earn it, 
and you've had to, to go through certain steps, you've had to achieve results um, at a certain level, you have to build up experience um, and go through the, a more formal approach um, to get to the next, uh, the next step in the career chain, then there's a sense of achievement. Um, so we, we try to build that in so that as people move up, they, they realise it's not just because they've been there for two years, it's because they're actually good at their job and they deserve to move to the next level. So, quick question before we move on, on to training. Um, how many credit limit reviews um, per hour take place in our shared service centre? <coughs> actually uh, 900. It's a bit of a trick question because uh, <laughs> we'll go for the highest number based on the previous question. Um, but it's, uh, it's actually 900. And if you think about that, that many decisions every hour being taken, uh, if we get it wrong, can lead, lead to financial loss. Um, that reinforces the, the need for the, the training program, um, which leads me in nicely to um, so about, about 15 every minute that, uh, that we're carrying out. And training, in my view, is, is probably the most important area. Um, the, the training program reinforces the, the career path. Um, it reduces uh, attrition because people that feel that there's an investment in, in their career are more likely to, to stay with an organisation. Um, and I was lucky to work for many years um, for a computer company, Digital Equipment. Uh, Laurie worked for the same company. It became known as Digital University because the training that was provided was, was first class. It, it, was, it was consistent every year, uh, very good quality, um, and people would queue up to join the company. Very good reputation, and people stayed for a long period of time. Um, so it is a good dif differentiator. It helps productivity, in my view. It's largely self-funding. If people are trained and do the job well and enjoy doing the job, they're more likely to, to be effective um, and hopefully want to stay. It has to be consistent um, and targeted where it's actually going to add value to the work people do, rather than tick a box and say, yes, someone's done training on, on X, Y, and Z, but if that's not something that they're actually going to use in their day-to-day -day work or it's going to help them to the next step in their career ladder, then it's not the right approach. So a blitz approach is, is not ideal to say, right, we've done nothing for five years, everybody's going on two weeks training um, on such and such. Um, so consistency um, and applying it where it adds value. And it, it needs to be also geared to the, the, the career plan. So people should have in mind what, uh, what they want to do based on which aspects they enjoy. People don't need to progress by being a people manager. There needs to be options to say, if you're particularly good at risk assessment, then we want to give you opportunities to, to progress um, and learn and do a good job without necessarily leading a team. Um, to give recognition for people that do a certain thing very well. Same for collecting cash. Some people are extremely good, but tendency is, all oh, right, they, they've collected cash for 18 months, now they need to move on and do something different. And we'll lose the opportunity of someone that's, that, that's very, very good at doing a certain aspect. Um, so we want them to apply the learning to, to what they're doing um, and close those skill gaps. So training has been a huge success um, and it, it's, Diana will, uh, will ask questions tomorrow on, on how that's been achieved. Um, but it's, it's something that we want to continue to invest and it's one of the areas we try and protect whenever the budgeting round comes up to say, right, where can we adjust costs for next year and, and reduce our, uh, our expense training is one that we, uh, we fight hard to protect. Um, we work with, with various training partners, 
um, that, uh, that, that Deanna uh, works with. Uh, Terra Associates, we've been involved with uh, since the start. Um, ACCEE, um, the uh, CICM, and more recently the, the Association of International Credit Directors and the Irish Institute of Credit uh, Management. Um, and including work that's ongoing now that um, I'm happy to be involved in around a, an MBA in international credit management that I'm uh, hoping to launch uh, next year sometime. So there's lots happening to extend the, the, the training program from, from basic training through to achievement of a, an MBA in, in international credit management. And that's also recognising the fact that and it's something that, that, that Frank is very passionate about, the internationalisation of, of our profession. Uh, to, to uh, promote it further. Um, so, and the main areas, constant focus, collecting cash, managing risk, but also people development um, to, to give people those skills for, for future stages in, in their career. People often say, is it a worthwhile investment? What happens if you train people and, and they just leave? Because you've given them all this training and then they become a great prospect for somebody else. But what happens if, if you don't train them and, and they stay? So, pictures speak, speak for themselves. Um, the last bit I want to run through is, is the allocation between country teams and the shared service centre. Um, and this is an area, that, and again, I've, I've read over the years lots of articles around shared service centres, some of the challenges where you have a hybrid model. Um, and uh, sometimes friction can creep in between teams that are still in the country and the, the central team. Um, clarity of roles is, is essential. Um, really, we've only achieved that with our most recent uh, recent uh, transition. Over the past year, 18 months, we've kind of got to the point where, where we need to be, where there's a lot more clarity about who, who, who does what. Communication is important, and that involves two-way travel. And this is again a budget we try and protect, is, is a travel budget so that people from the countries can, can travel to the shared service centre and vice versa. Um, so not always easy, sometimes you get travel bans uh, when the figures aren't great. So it, it's, it can be a battle from time to time to do <coughs> as much as we'd like to. Also providing regular business updates. Um, so somebody collecting debt in, uh, in Italy based in Cluj as some understanding of what's happening with, with the Italian business. Um, so Adina, for example, um, will go to, uh, to Milan from time to time, join the sales conference, um, meet with the, the, the uh, sales organisation, and then can feed back to, the, to her teams what's going on in that particular country. Um, it's, it's work in progress, there's more we need to do, but it, it's very important that we keep that communication going. Um, where we have people in the countries, and the, the teams now aren't, aren't particularly large, uh, the vast majority of activity takes place in our shared service centre, but where we have people in the country, it's really to take advantage of, of physical presence. Things like customer visits um, is, is one example, where it, it adds a lot of value, because they can jump in a car and be, be there uh, fairly quickly, at uh, a low cost. Practical things like allocating checks. Um, UK, we still get thousands and thousands of checks every day. Um, also France, Spain, we, we still get paid by check. Um, it doesn't make sense for somebody to, to scan all that information across and then someone else to pick it up. Sometimes it's quicker to, to do that work in the country, um, so we avoid double handling. Um, so obviously we want to move customers away from checks because they're inefficient. But it's the customer's choice how, how they pay us at the end of the day. Um, things like quality monitoring. Uh, before the, the, the recent transition of work, a lot of it was done for certain countries within the country. Um, again, it can, create, uh, it can create friction, it can create a bit of an us and them, and it can also um, create issues around speed of feedback. Um, it's kind of building up a um, a lot of information rather than if, if there is an issue, if somebody's new and they don't understand what, uh, what the process should be, um, then we need to, need to move very quickly. So all of the monitoring is, is managed and, and, and takes place within the shared service centre, uh, and that's a European quality team. Um, 
although its focus is by country, but it, it's a European team, they can be as critical as they like because they don't report in via a country route, um, they report in uh, for a central route. Um, Double handing is, is, is important uh, to avoid that, and that's that's really we've we've uh, managed to tackle that one in our last transition. Um, and one team approach, one team approach is is it's critical um, in my view, especially in our environment where we do have teams in the country and a shared service centre, um, shared targets, um, incentives, and the real emphasis is either we all do well or we all fail. So it's not a question, well, this, this team in this, this location did well, this team didn't. Everybody's got to, got to contribute. Um, we try where we can to have drives for cash or we just had a drive for age debt reduction to help with the, with the provision. Um, so we make those European targets. So we either all do well or uh, all we'll, we'll fail in that target. Very brief summary. Uh, have we been successful? Certainly have. Um, whilst we've been doing all this work around harmonising, etc., et we've actually been, been uh, achieving very good uh, KPI results. We've knocked about a third off, off, the, uh, off the old debt. Um, bad debt's coming down as a percent of sales and in absolute terms. E-billing, um, we're increasing month on month, so we, we save money there. Um, and employee morale is, is exceptionally good. Um, some of the areas, I won't go through all of this, again, if, if, you, if you want more information, uh, the Magnificent Seven are here to, uh, to provide the, the uh, context to, to this. Um, many people, including Mark, have, have mentioned that the, it's a joy to visit the, our shared service centre in Cluj. Um, our international CFO has said he hates going into his HQ in, in Florida, even though it's in, in a lovely location. He says people are so damn miserable. He loves coming to Cluj because everybody's cheerful. It might be minus 20 outside, but everybody's smiling, and uh, it, it's just a totally different atmosphere. So he, he enjoys coming to Cluj, as, as I certainly do. Um, anybody else in the organisation that, that visits just say it's very uplifting, and that's the people that, that, uh, that deliver that. So mor morale is great. Um, very briefly, in, in 30 seconds, um, what have we learned? Harmonising and simplifying work around best practice, um, move away from country silos, and avoid the tendency to, to, to lift, drop, and then leave it um, when, when the shared service centre is established. Career path and training plans to support that career path. And clarity of roles between, between the shared service centre and, uh, and country teams. Probably the most important thing that, that we've learned, we try and uh, reinforce, uh, as we say in uh, in uh, Romania, distraxia facuta, which means uh, have fun. And this was the team after a very successful performance uh, when we got together on a, on a Saturday to celebrate the success. So you can see uh, genuine smiles there, even though people giving up their weekend free, um, just to be together to celebrate uh, a success that, uh, that, uh, that they delivered. So, many thanks for your time. Have we got time for some questions, Mark? <coughs> Hi, so I saw that uh, you pass the activities as uh, transitions uh, through the years. It's uh, similar also in our shared service uh, in Coca-Cola. But uh, what were the biggest challenges which you face uh, during the transition period, and uh, just just the biggest one, and how you deal with them. Thank you. Um, and I guess each transition has, has been different. If I think back to the first transition, which was the most stressful, um, and I, I guess thinking back to when the UK direct channel went live. Um, which was around November 2007, and that was a, a huge business and, and massive volumes. Um, probably the biggest challenge was the volume of inbound calls, getting people trained up to a certain level as thousands and thousands of calls were coming in every single day. Um, so the, the, the pressure that was put on people that were trying to learn the job 
And we have a lot of complexity in, in our business, even though we just fill our distribution centres with stuff, people order it, we deliver it, and then we, we get them to pay for it. But we have lots of lots of complexity built in. So if people try to understand when the customer's screaming down the phone about an issue and they're trying to work the system, keep the customer happy at the same time, when the queues are building up. Um, and our drop call rate was, was getting very high. Um, and so probably that was the, the most difficult part was, was the, the, the training of people at the very start. Um, and I think it was, it was underestimated by the people that, that advised us on the project, uh, the experts, um, the, the BPO experts that said, right, this, this is what we need to do and everything will be great. I think they underestimated the, the actual volumes that we deal with, the number of customers um, and the number of transactions that lead to a huge number of, of inbound calls. So that, that was probably our, our first challenge. Later challenges was more around the interaction between country teams and the shared service center. Some of the friction that, that, can, that can crop up from time to time, and it varied by country. Um, UK, I would say, was, was, was very smooth. Other countries, not, not quite so easy. Um, so, so yeah, it, Different challenges as, as we've gone through different stages of the transition, but the first transition was, was the most stressful. I mean, people still bear the scars of, uh, <laughs> of, uh, of that one. Right. Thanks. Um, my, my question is, I, I, I'm curious to... You turn it on. Sorry? Turn it on. Okay. I'll try this out microphone. Yep. So, curious to, to know uh, how it ensures that the country teams, mainly sales, are satisfied and happy with your performance and level of your support. So the way how you how you ensure <coughs> the local teams are happy. Um, I think um, probably how many phone calls I get each day from angry sales managers. Um, <laughs> Is, is, is one indicator. We don't. We haven't got any any particular surveys that, that pick it up. Um, but my experience, and certainly in Office Depot, if, if sales aren't happy with something that, that we're doing, they'll tell us very quickly. Um, and um, if I think about UK and Ireland, which which was the area I was most involved in um, early on, uh, people would would soon pick up the phone and say we're not happy with the way this is working or that's working. Um, so there's, there's a good feedback mechanism because our, our sales people are, uh, are very direct. If there's something we've done they're not happy with, they'll pick up the phone. Um, a lot of them are based in the same location as me and they'll, they'll come and knock on the office door. Um, so I have to say that I think um, the complaints from sales have, have been very few. Generally, they would have happened anyway, whether we were just in the countries or whether we were also in a shared service centre. There's always sometimes we disagree with a decision we've taken. Um, that's that's happened o over the years. So, um, but yeah, I mean, in answer to your question, that there isn't a a formal survey approach, but we, we do get very quick feedback from from whether it's sales, customer services, any part of the organisation that, that we could impact. Um, if they're not happy with our performance, somebody would pick up the phone and, and, uh, and tell me. Thanks. John, was it more stressful setting up the office depot or being a father to five daughters? That's <laughs> <laughs> uh, a good question, John. I think uh, five daughters is probably uh, probably more stressful. Um, yeah, de definitely. That's, that's probably taken more years of my life than... Uh, than, than uh, yeah, probably Larry. Yeah, it's, uh, I don't think they can train you for that though. Hoping your daughters. But, uh. Thanks. Uh, I have okay. Do we have any any further questions? Sure. Okay. Hi. Uh, you said several times that you unified KPIs for like whole Europe. So, do you not take uh, in consideration differences, culture differences, and I think payment behavior in some countries is different than others? Absolutely. And I think that in terms of when we set a target, we take that into account. In terms of how we calculate the result is where we've unified it. 
So if we look at DSO as an example, although I'm not a fan of DSO, um, but DSO in Spain, we would calculate the same way that we do for, say, Austria. In Austria, we might achieve 28 days. In Spain, it might be 98 days. So we'd have a, a target based on reality, um, and the target is to improve on where we are, but the, the method of calculation has been unified. So we can compare apples with apples, and that way we, we can create a European DSO, for example, rather than add up all the different businesses and divide by the number, which, which isn't an accurate way of doing it. Now we, we can create European um, numbers to measure our performance, uh, because we have a, a unified calculation method. Okay. Um, thank you very much, John. That was uh, yeah, very much. Uh, we thank th thank you to John and Phil and indeed all our presenters today. Um, I'll just wrap up very quickly. Um, we need to start preparing for the for the evening dinner and uh, but um, I was just thinking we started out this morning with our objective of collect uh, connecting excellence and I think through the course of the last eight hours or so that's um, we're well on that way we're well on that path and I was uh, I was thinking of somebody um, uh, somebody else said are you coming to credit matters uh, this year and they said nah there's nothing on the agenda that interests me there's nothing that inspires us and I was looking through the program just now, and I include myself in this number. I think there must be more than somewhere between 250 and 300 years worth of experience that's spoken today, plus another probably 500 years worth that's, that's sitting amongst us. So, um, yeah, we've, we've covered a lot about sort of um, investing in people and technology. The internationalism, John, very nicely set us up with uh, various... Uh, the initiatives, we've talked about internationalization, MBA, um, and the best practice initiative in the Irish Institute. Um, I'm very proud to say that we're very much involved in that. Um, we're writing one of the modules for the MBA. Internationalization is something that we're very much part of, and I touched on it this morning, that um, everything we're doing is connected to all other countries. So if you're a member of our association, you move to Ireland or to another country, all that accreditation and investment goes with you. It's not siloed, it's not country specific anymore. Um, and the best practice initiative is very much our best practice. Uh, John was talking about the, um, uh, sorry, Phil was talking about the, the QICM in the UK. And we have our own um, uh, Central Europe based um, initiative along the same lines, which we call the best practice initiative. And that's uh, that's in the booklets you have on your desk, and I hope that's of interest. Okay, so um, we'll wrap up now. Um, dinner is at seven o'clock, um, literally just outside here. And earlier I was talking about Krakow, and we are going to try now and run the video about Krakow. And before we do, um, I would say that we, I did mention to a few of you at lunchtime that um, if you want to preliminary reserve your places today, uh, on the registration desk you can. We're not asking you to pay. We won't invoice you until August or so next year. But uh, if you register today, you get um, quite an attractive discount, shall we say, on what the price will be next year. So we're going to do the technology and we're going to run the video again. <laughs>